adhering to an ethical code during challenging times is a trait in many historical and present-day leaders that we've come to admire. But let's have ourselves a pocket-sized pep talk because in business, it takes courage, often a moral courage, to ignore the voices that attempt to justify unethical behavior and hold the line on ethics. Stay put. It's harder than it sounds. A pocket-sized pep talk podcast that can help energize your business and your life with a quick, inspiring message. Now, here's your host, Rob Jollis. Today's guest, Rick Swiggin, is an author and the founder and principal consultant of Arch Performance. With a background in human resources and safety, Rick provides consulting to a variety of organizations on the developmental needs of potential leaders. He invites clients to question themselves in order to foster incessant learning and inspire the best versions of themselves. Along with his co-author, his new book, The Practice of Ethical Leadership, Insights from Psychology and Business in Building an Ethical Bottom Line. It offers effective suggestions for developing ethical leaders. I see it just came out, by the way, about a month ago, so it's fairly fresh. Happy to have you with us and welcome to the show, Rick. Glad to be here. Really excited about this opportunity. Good. Well, it's a pleasure. So let's dive right in. You know, ethics is is a tough topic to argue about because everyone assumes that they're ethical. Absolutely. So let's, yeah. So let's start at the beginning with you. What motivated you to write this book and and, and make a statement about ethics? Uh, well, a couple of things. And first of all, I should say I'm not an ethicist by trade. Okay. So I I, I do the things that you talked about in the introduction. But I am not a philosopher, so I'm more concerned about the process of how we make ethical decisions than whether a given decision is right or wrong. OK, so just to put that out on the table. So my background br briefly, uh, I, I've done a, a selection and assessment piece for a long time. I sold for a number of years as well. And I know a lot of your listeners sell for a living. I did that for about 15 years. And so I've been in the trenches and can talk about that. Uh, what motivated me specifically is kind of a lifelong interest in how do people reason about moral issues? Because we're all different. Uh, what are the differences between culture? And we'll probably talk more about culture as we go. And then lastly, I started to work with a guy from Germany a couple of years ago, and he said, why don't we write a book? And here we are. So. Welcome to the party. Is this your first book? No, this is the third, but uh, the fir first is really a serious one. Let's put it that way. Okay. All right. As if ethics is not serious, but... Uh, right. Right. <laughs> That said, uh, and how about, uh, I noticed you have a co-author. Have you ever co-authored a book before? Uh, only with my wife, and we're still married, so th that's a good sign. I, I work collaboratively pretty well. Good. Uh, well, better you than me. I, I, I'm i still <laughs> married, but I have never co-written co a book. I'm not sure I could pull it off. Well, it's a stretch, and on, yeah. on this one that we wrote, I mean, I, I met my, my co-author, who, who's probably 30 years younger than I am, lives in Berlin. Um, we met... Prior to the pandemic, I haven't seen him since then, other than on Zoom calls. So we wrote the book virtually, which is an interesting experience as well. I can imagine. Yeah, boys, we we all got a, a, a lesson in virtual communications, didn't we, over the past few years? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Well, here, let me let me come out of the gate with this. I, I just don't think that anybody wakes up in the morning, yawns, and says, you know, I feel like being unethical today. Mm -hmm. And yet we struggle with it. Why do so many in business kind of lose their way? You know, I, I think that's a really, really good question, Rob. I mean, the the simple answer, and I go back to what you said earlier. When, when I talk to groups and say, how many of you consider yourself to be ethical, law-abiding, whatever terms you want to use, everybody raises their hand, right? Mm -hmm. And then something happens out there to change that. I think it's fundamentally two things. Uh, one, it's the organizational culture. OK, I mean, and, and not to oversimplify that, but what does the culture encourage? What does it reward? What are the risk taking behaviors, et cetera? Uh, and then I think the, the second factor, you know, not to get into to down in the weeds, but what do you reward in a given organization? And if the end of the day, I'll give you a comparison here. You reward total sales volume. You reward bringing in new business and you don't reward doing the right thing. In the context of that, that gets eroded. It gets eroded pretty quickly, I think, because then the issue becomes: How do I drive more sales? Not am I driving the right sales? Am I doing it the right way? 
any of those kinds of things. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, uh, and I, rem I remember the first time I ever saw it was with Infinity, uh, the car manufacturer that was putting a heavy bonus on customer satisfaction on what the customer said after they left the dealership mm -hmm. and and that's where their their bonuses were tied and all of a sudden you you could see you could feel the shift of an organization so as opposed to just what you know what you were mentioning which is as opposed to okay are we 100 percent of plan 150 percent of plan listen we all want to be at plan or above i've got it but yep. picking in a bonus based on how satisfied that customer is or was with the process they went through to me that's a, a much better report card absolutely and i think uh, probably a more a better reflection of did the did the uh salesperson or whomever treat me in an appropriate correct fashion i i, I couldn't agree more i think that's a that's a great story and a great example you may have seen um at the cnn ran a two-part series the, late, the last two sundays on um the Columbia explosion, the space, and boy, does that speak to culture right there. I mean, because right. people knew it was a problem. They knew the tiles were a problem. And the culture in NASA at the time was you couldn't speak up. You couldn't raise the right issues. And and look at the results of that. It can be disastrous. Mm. Well, let me throw another word at you. Sure. Justification. Uh, I I find and, and let me I'll spell it out. I think you know where yeah, I'm going. Yeah. I I think I find that most people who go down the wrong path tend to want to justify it to make it okay so that they don't feel unethical. I think that's probably an accurate statement. I'd have I'd be pressed to think of an example immediately, but uh, I, I think fundamentally you're correct. Most of us want to feel like we are good people at the end of the day. And that we did the right thing at the end of the day. Um, and if we lapse at points, and I'm human, I've lapsed at points, uh, we do want to provide a justification. Here's why I did that. Here's what caused me to do that. Um, I knew it wasn't the right thing at the time, but that's what caused me to do it. And I, I think in my sales, my sales career, um, you know, the the I lost sales um, and I walked away from sales. Okay. And that to me was the bigger challenge. And it did my organization back me up when I said, I don't think we should talk to this customer. I don't think they fit. We fit, our product fits their needs. I don't think they behave in a manner that it's going to be a partnership with us, any of those variables. And I walked away. I wanted to know my, my organization had my back and I don't think they do in every case. Right. Well, we share something very meaningful. Because 31 years ago, roughly, in April, actually, first week in April, 31 years ago, I walked away from a previous, my, my employer, based on an ethics issue uh, of, we, we had just produced uh, a product for a customer, which we knew wasn't really right. Mm -hmm. And the customer was questioning it. And the company told me, don't just keep your mouth shut. If they want to push it, we'll be fine. If not, let it be. And I got pulled into a separate room by the customer very quietly. And customer looked me right in the eye and said, if you tell us this is this is the right product, the right way, we're fine. But I need to hear you say it. I couldn't say it. Right. And I mean, I, I think the, uh, the the situations I'm proudest of in my sales career was when I said to the customer, it's, we're not the right vendor for you. We're not the right, we don't have the right product. You need to go elsewhere. And, and trust me on that. Somebody else is better than we are. I felt really good about that. And fortunately, I by and large work for organizations that back that up. Not in every case, but by and large, I did. Yeah. And I wish they would, because there's an argument to be made that you, you, you actually increased your market penetration with that particular move. I see now in your head, you Absolutely. know, the numbers of who talks to who. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and in my case, um, most of my selling career, my, my title was a global account manager. So I worked with one of the large auto firms um, and word of mouth was huge. Mm -hmm. So if, if I did the right thing, the ethical thing, the honest thing in one place, that was going to benefit me downstream because they all talk to one another internally. So absolutely true. Yeah. And you know, and I'll I'll leave this point. But when we, when I brought up justification, uh, it's a podcast. So when I when I hold things up, I'll tell you what I'm holding up. I'm actually holding up a Mont Blanc pen. Mm -hmm. I'm showing it to Rick right now. Uh, eight years ago, I was given a Mont Blanc pen by a class. It was very special to me. 
I, um, I, I was at a library one time and I left it there. I forgot it. I went back. It was gone. And about a month later, I was at an, I was at a restaurant and was getting ready to get up and I saw a Mont Blanc sitting there. Now let's be clear. I knew for a fact that wasn't my Mont Blanc, right. but I had a voice in my head saying, well, somebody took yours. Maybe you get this one. Mm-hmm. And that's what I mean in terms of we have to watch those voices because it was pretty compelling. It was like, well, now the universe is even. Well, it's not even. That's not my pen. Right, right, right. And I, I think what, what also happens in it, because those still small voices come up all the time in sales situations. Right. Uh, you know, and I, I can think of two examples to, to share with you. They're not mine. They're from friends. But one was a guy who was in a startup situation where they didn't have a product. They didn't have a customer yet. And the the question for them is, how far do they go in telling the truth? I mean, if they're sitting across the table from someone who's a potential buyer who says, well, have you guys done this before? If so, who have you done it before? Do they, do they give the honest answer or do, or do they not? And he said they struggled with it constantly because they, they were desperate to get that first customer because they knew as soon as they had that one, they'd have many to follow, which turned out to be true. But maintaining that balance and and listening to the small voice in your ear, I think is critical. And I've got another friend who, a uh, very similar situation in a startup. Uh, and this was back in the days of starting early days of video conferencing. He went into a company, happened to be a tobacco company. Um, and the deal would have made their business. I mean, and he and his partner walked away from it. He said, it's, they're not the right customer for us given our beliefs and our values. And and that's a long-winded way of going back and saying, it's really all about internal values. It's about the organization values. And I would hasten to add, it's also about the leader's values, what he or she re- reinforces with people on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah. And you know, um, Rick, the, the I'm thinking of TARP, Technical Assistance Research Programs, some of the companies out there that are doing research on you know, how many people uh, a dissatisfied customer will talk about. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can play and we're not going, but we can, we can sort of stray straddle that ethical line and try and justify certain moves, but you go in there and tell the customer the wrong thing. Um, And I I know it's a, it's a big range here, but they're saying anywhere between 11 to 20 people they'll Mm -hmm. tell. And I used to uh, say 10, but I believe 11 or 20. yeah, Yeah. Uh, well, you know what? I, I think what made it go up is social media. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, 25 years ago, if you weren't happy, you wrote a letter. Yeah, you told a couple friends at dinner. Um, mm-hmm. Now you can get your voice out there. Yeah, absolutely. So, so it, it's the right thing to do. But, you know, the, the thing about ethics to me is, uh, well, let me let me let me ask you and then I'll kind of give you mine. What, what's a working definition for, for ethics in your mind? You know, I really simplistically, I would say yeah. do, doing the right thing. And and let me explain why I say that, because I think um, you can have two firms with radically different values. OK, let me give you a case in point. Hobby Lobby, distinctly Christian, doesn't work on open on Sundays, espouses Christian values, says this is where, how we're going to live, how we're going to be. Um, and when you when the uh, Dobbs decision came down on abortion. Uh, they took a definite stand in one direction, which I think is ethical, given their particular values. I'm not making a judgment about them; simply right, saying right. it's ethical. Mm-hmm. Amazon, on the other hand, um, when the Dobbs decision came down, made a radically different decision based on our values. This was their statement: "We're going to support you if you feel the need to get an abortion. We'll provide travel expenses, support that way, those sort of things, etc." Radically different decisions both of which I think in that particular culture and those particular environments were the right thing for them, given their, their values. And I'm not passing judgment overall should be done, but that it's, it's, I think idiosyncratic to the organization within the context of law and order and greater good and the golden rule and some of those kinds of things, but it's doing the right thing. Yeah. I I agree with you. I'm going to add a couple words to it. Just I'm the amateur. You're the pro. So I so when I add them, I'm I'm asking you, not telling you. But I, in my mind, I've always heard of doing the right thing, even when no one knows that you're doing the right thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's easy kind of, if somebody's kind of the, looking over your shoulder. 
right? right? It's the classic definition of integrity. Are you going to do yeah. the right thing on the night shift when no one's watching? Right. And I, to some extent, I agree with that. And and that is fundamentally, and again, I know a lot of your listeners are sales people. That is absolutely true for your salespeople because we're out there on a daily basis carrying the bag, doing whatever. Nobody's looking over your shoulder. It's my business to run uh, in my particular bailiwick. I may not see my boss for except for a quarterly basis. No one travels with me. I'm independent. And that 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 still small voice needs to say, do the right thing on a con constant basis. Right. It's a right. struggle. I, I'd be the first to admit it. Yeah. Uh, here's an obscure, obscure client I had, but I think you'd be interested in hearing this. Uh, I one time trained uh, almost 700 polygraph examiners. Okay, that and, is, that's fairly and, obscure, but okay. <laughs> but you know that's that was the first time I was introduced to justification mm -hmm. because uh, I remember sitting there watching somebody who ended up um, he was a person who had embezzled. Uh, I was in an observation room. Mm -hmm. uh, it took a while, and the person finally confessed. But the first thing they said was, well, but he left the safe open and he's got more money than God. I'm just trying to put my kids through school. Mm -hmm. And and there it is again of, well, that doesn't make it any any more ethical. Right. But that's right. how you're living with it, apparently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's spot on. And I, I mean, I think the other issue I'd throw in there, Rob. Yeah. I mean, I think it's um, I'll use the term fairness, but I think this is a true one. It is, are we all treated the same way consistently by management or my leadership? Um, and do, do do variations on that, that still small voice pay off the same way for all of us? And let me give you a case in point what I mean by that. Um, yeah, I worked for a, a, an organization at one point. There were a number of people that were peers. We weren't on a formal team. Um, and I, I was reasonably successful there, very successful. One of my colleagues, uh, very successful as well, but the proverbial pain in the ass, um, didn't exhibit the team player kind of values internally, um, a little bit of a prima donna, uh, and, and that individual got rewarded till the cows came home, where those of us who were successful but quiet and kept our heads down got a totally different treatment. And so I, to some extent, I think that perceived fairness, that there's equity in terms of we're all treated equally, we're all accountable in the same way, has an impact on how I behave out there in the field at the same time. Are you, are you with me on that? The reinforcement's important. Absolutely. And, and that brings us to kind of the leaders <laughs> that are involved in this. So uh, Let's 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 turn this thing to the side a little bit and look at it from a leadership perspective. What can leaders do to ensure that their organization or those individuals in the field are performing in an ethical manner? You know, I, I'll go back to a couple things um, and, and we can talk about these. I mean, one is and I hear this repeatedly from people who are working out in organizations. I work with a large utility firm right now, um, and one of my contacts there said, to me, it's all, ethics is all about accountability. You can tell me what's ethical. If you don't hold me accountable for it, you're going to get variation. You're going to get change. So there's an accountability factor. So I think leaders have to not only say, here's the expectation, but be willing to deal with variance. And in some cases, that's a hard call, right? Because yeah. the person who's varying uh, from expectations may be your highest performer. Uh but you, I think you have to hold people accountable. You have to have clear expectations. And I think because ethics is a strange animal, you need to be willing to talk with your people about the decisions you're making, why you're making those, get their input, have a level of transparency and openness so that we all know we're grappling with issues of right and wrong. You, you with me on that? And totally. not, not everybody has that moral compass, if you will. Um right. You know, it, I used to work in manufacturing a lot and the manufacturing managers that I talked to would go home at the end of the day and say, my day was good if, if I kept everybody safe. Yeah. And I, I would expand that and say, I think your day's good if you keep everybody safe in a manufacturing environment and you know you did the right thing. It's easier said than done. And that that to me is a mark of a successful leader. 
yeah. I kept my sales team safe. They're happy. They're psychologically safe. They're comfortable in their jobs. I'm providing coaching. And at the end of the day, I did the right thing with them. Yeah. You know, I, I was listening to you. I'm sort of taking my sales salesman's hat off. I'm putting on my trainer hat because I'm, I'm thinking to teach ethics as a trainer. Uh, and I want to get into some process moves with you in just a second. Sure. But I think I would be creating more simulations than role plays. You know where I'm coming from with that. In other <laughs> words, let's put some some case studies out there and not to trick you up, but to show you how challenging that line can be. Yeah, I think you know, you're, you're preaching to the choir on that one. I mean, one of, one of the issues we deal with in our book is, you know, how do you deal? How do you develop ethical leaders? OK, and that's really, really a complex question if you think about it. I mean, look at, you know, the various churches you look at, look at the Boy Scouts, for example, all of whom have values-driven programs, uh, indoctrinate people, but people misbehave still. So knowing what the difference is between right and wrong and translating that into behavior is really tricky, I think. And to your point, uh, training in the traditional sense, I think is also really, really difficult. Um, take something like sexual harassment training, for example. I, I can go through the training I can understand what sexual harassment is or isn't. I can pass the test. Does that change my behavior relative to sexual harassment? For most of it, prob most of us probably, but for a minority, it doesn't. Uh, and I think, to your point, any effective development program has to have a training component because there's information there. It has to have a mentorship component. And I think significantly, and this is to your earlier point, and we say this in the book, and I know you haven't read it, so you're really brilliant. Um, it has to have a case study component because I think that's where the rubber meets the road. You get what happens in training is it, there's a little bit of group think, right? Particularly when you're talking about ethics issues. Nobody's going to stand up there in a class and say, "Here's what I would do," and I know it's unethical, but I would do it. Nobody's. That's not going to happen. If you give people a case on an individual basis and say, "Okay, you got to decide what to do." Then you have to come in and present that. You have to deal with challenges and respond appropriately. That's a way different learning experience, at least in my, and, and I see you nodding. So I suspect yeah. you're, you're headed in the same direction. I think abso absolutely, when you're talking about ethics, it's case study and dealing with moral issues. Honestly. Right. Right. And putting them into some real gray areas. I'm, sm I'm part of me is laughing because. When you outed me on not reading your book, I thought, well, I could tell him I read the book, but I'm dealing with a guy talking about ethics today, so I probably should stay stay <laughs> stay, stay, in the, stay in the lane. Yeah, I stay, get in you. My, stay in my lane. Uh, you know, I, I'll give you an example of a simulation. You know, mm -hmm. we uh, I won't go through the whole thing, but mm -hmm. you remember uh, the, the old uh, AMC Pacer? Mm -hmm. uh, the there was a the Mirth Mobile or whatever the the Marth Garth Mobile I think it one, was one of the two or three ugliest yeah. cars ever made. Anyway, uh, we have a simulation where we're dealing with somebody selling an old car does old Pacer doesn't really work. The other case study booklet says you're a collector you're you're one window short, and it would cost you twenty five hundred dollars to get just the window. One leads to the other. You see the one person's getting ready to sell theirs. They, they, they tell their kid, if I can get $500, I'm a superstar. Uh, but there's a couple little things, like a little bit of a leaky, not a little bit. There's a leaky radiator. Do you disclose that? Remember, you don't know the, uh, you don't know both sides. And when I run that simulation, it's longer, but I'm giving it to you fast. Sure. I would say at least 75% of the time that radiator leak is not disclosed. Right. And, right. um, and, and then there's some justification that goes on afterwards. Well, I wasn't asked. Uh, but that's the kind of thing. That, and that's why, as a trainer, I want to put you in some gray areas, not to get you right or wrong or slap your wrist, to show you how difficult the line can be to find. Right. And I, I think the, the key issue on that, Rob, when you're talking about ethics in, a, in an organizational culture, is that kind of case study approach, those discussions of those real life examples, because they are right, needs to be continued because it's it's not a one shot affair. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to maintain an ethical environment uh, and, and God bless them, I'll pick on Boeing, for example, for a second, uh, that's a that's a constant 
equation and it needs to be a constant top of mind issue uh, because you can be a Boeing situation and say, okay, we're going to cut costs. We're going to speed up the assembly line to cut costs. Um, we're going to do a number of things that financially make sense, but what are the implications of that relative to safety for our customers, the work environment we're in, the quality we put out? And that to me is where organizations go astray. They look at that the traditional bottom line and don't look at the implications of some of those decisions. And Boeing right now is a classic example of that, I think. Yeah. I, I think they are. And they were, you know, unfortunately an easy target, but you know, without even knowing Rick, I'll bet you that they went through some sort of formal training of some kind, probably they probably, they can't count them on, on one hand, how many times they've gone through it, but what falls apart and you were just sort of nipping at that is, well, there's talking about it and then there's implementing and staying on top of it. Mm -hmm. So um, let's, let's climb into some process pieces with you. Sure. And maybe you can, because the more process oriented we are, in other words, we could tell great stories in training. That's very hard to implement, but mm -hmm. if we give them something that's measurable, at least we we've got a more clear cut right and wrong. So how about just a couple process moves from the book that, um, you can can at least be uh, help a leader you know stay on track at least yeah. help them implement yeah but well, let me i'll take a couple things on that and okay I, I think that's a terrific lead-in question robin and i'll preface that to say when we go in and work with an organization um and they want to work on improving their ethical culture their environment etc we start by talking with the ceo and if the ceo won't talk to us we don't want to play I mean, and, and it's it, it, so to me, that's a process step in saying the senior leader for a business unit, whether it's the company, small department, whether it's the sales team, he or she, that's the first step has to be committed to it. OK, has to say doing right or wrong, doing the right thing is going to be our mantra come hell or high water. I think the the second step uh, is and I've, I've talked about this a little bit is looking again at the organizational values and bringing those down off the poster on the wall and re-examining those. And again, you can do those in a department and say a couple things. One is, do, do our values describe how we behave with one another? I mean, operationalize that. And do they derive, do they drive decisions making for us? Okay. So, and those are different hierarchy of values, I think, but it's making those values real and then the third step, I think, from a process perspective is how do we incorporate those values then into our reward recognition and communication systems? Because you got to have that. And then the fourth, system, fourth point, and this is really where the process is, to, my, to your point earlier, is continuing to talk about those on, an, on a daily basis. You know, if you're having, you know, you've got a sales team and you're meeting weekly or bi-weekly with your sales team, you're reviewing the numbers, you're doing, you know, whatever you do typically relative to metrics, you've got to include, are we doing the right thing? What are the decisions we've made over the last two weeks that we need to discuss? What do we do right? What did we do wrong? What are you guys curious about as we move forward? So to me, it's leadership at the top, a couple steps, but really it's operationalizing it on a regular basis, you know, I, I again, I worked in manufacturing where in manufacturing, when you do shift change, there's typically a safety huddle at the beginning of every day or every shift change. That ought to be the same situation for any organization when they're starting their shift, having their regular meetings, they talk about, are we doing the right thing as well? Yeah. You know, it, it, as you go through it, it's I'm reminiscing. It reminds me of how Xerox back in the 80s implemented quality. Mm -hmm. While everyone else was thinking that's nice and it lasted about a week, Xerox was on it for decades. And one of the ways they did it, first of all, was they followed Duran's mm -hmm. philosophy of it's coming from the top down. Yep. Just like you said. OK, um, and that doesn't mean management sits in the back looking at their you know, smartphones. They're they're in the U-shaped room and they're mixing it up with everybody else. No yeah. observing. And, and that's that's why we go back to the CEO and say, if you don't yeah. want to play uh, and you want to create the program in the month, we're not interested in doing it because right. your, your people will ask outlast you. Um, right. and, and, and a lot of the principles you're talking about do come from the quality movement. No question about it. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and it's funny, you're right, because I'm thinking about something else you said earlier, which was we actually changed the way we were viewed um, and rated a salesperson. Obviously, your percentage of plan was really important to us, but there was always a percentage of how you were adhering to the quality process, basically your problem solving, quality improvement, and could you document the things you were doing? If you could, in other words, I don't have time for it, but look at me, I'm 250% of plan. Mm -hmm. You're a superstar, but we, we promote people within the organization who exceed expectations in all areas. And in fact, when you have the courage to say, we're going to put a slice of that pie in to implement this ethics training, to implement mm -hmm. whichever training, uh, that becomes the conscience of the organization and you, and you have a shot at it. Absolutely. The, the other thing I would add to that real quickly, and I'm not sure where we are with time because I've got plenty, but I don't know what your plans are. I'm a big believer in past behavior predicts future behavior. So, you know, so to the point, if I'm going to promote somebody into a sales management team leader role and ethics is a concern, I want to promote the male or female that has demonstrated they do, they are ethical on a daily basis, that they've lived up to the pressure. They've listened to that still small voice. I know they may have other skills around leadership, et cetera, but I know from their past they will make the right decision. Those are the people I want to promote because I, I'm not guaranteed because people change and there are a lot of variables there. But that's the one I want to look at seriously is the person who's done it done it well in the past. I agree. Okay, and let's stay there a little bit, but let's slide it into hiring. Probably the biggest challenge of any organization. I consult with a lot of organizations. Sounds like you've got a lot of organizations. Boy, how much time they're spending on the hiring. But how do you... I, they, they, it's challenging finding a salesperson, by the way. I'm constantly asked, is there a new assessment? Is there a new test? We're trying to figure out how to find a great salesperson. Well, mm -hmm. let's shift it. I'm trying to find an ethical human being. And if I ask them yes or no, are you ethical? Uh, I think I'm going to answer yes. Ever yes. So, so, so let me go deeper. Yeah. So here, here's the way we answer that question, Rob. I mean, historically, and, and you've dealt with hiring salespeople. So I'll ask you this question to start with. Do they in the where the sales the selection processes you've been involved in? Do they look for salespeople who are high integrity? It's it's a rhetorical question because my experience with that is it's about half. Some some acknowledge it, some don't talk about it at all. Okay, to me the the easiest way to deal with all that is to say what does it take to be an ethical leader from a behavior or trait perspective? Okay, so let me give you a couple because uh, it's breaking it down. I, I think an ethical leader has to be able to discern right from wrong, okay? goes back to the case study. Can I measure that in a selection system where I give somebody a case study and let them work through what's right, what's wrong? Second component of that, they've got to be able to reason about critical issues. They've got to have critical think thinking capability that says, here are the assumptions I'm dealing with. Here are the various courses of action I can take. Here's the decision I'm going to make. So critical reasoning is a second component. You can absolutely measure that. And then the th third, and there are more, but I'll go back to one that we've talked about already. I think the ethical leader takes a stand. And this is where I think the case studies are invaluable because I want to have somebody actually do a case study as part of the selection process. Come in and present to me and the hiring team, what their recommendations are. So that gives me ability to see them on their feet, right? Yeah. It's an assessment of their of their presentation skills, gives me the ability to challenge them in a Q&A session, see how they respond to stress, do they maintain a common line, et cetera. So I think on those three things alone, you, you can measure them using psychometric tests, you could measure them using behavioral interviews, and certainly you can use case studies as a form of assessment to get a rounded picture. Can this person think? Do they have a concept of right and wrong? Not everybody does, by the way, uh, I don't think. Um, and lastly, and I think this is as important as anything else, can they take a stand? You know, because again, a salesperson, an entrepreneur has to say no at some point and has to be willing to deal with the, ch able to deal with the challenges associated with that. Yeah, I, I love, love your it. I love your case study option. By the way, I really well, you, you and I are on. We we we're singing from the same hymn book here. 
I, I'm, I'm with you, even with a salespeople, I, I, they'll know all the answers to many of the questions. I'm fine right. with that. And, and I'm not necessarily looking for them to tell me how they're going to win every account. Right. I just want to follow the, the way they're tracking it. I actually think I learn more from how they lose than how mm -hmm. they win. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, you know, are, are they a victim? Uh, are they, you know, are they trying to balance their own personal feedback? These are the kind of things I think that will keep somebody in there a little bit longer. Yep. One last, one last real fast point, but I, uh, I, I got on a panel one time and they were asking me, what do you look for when you hire a salesperson? And I kind of, the, 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 some of the better answers were taken. Although a lot of it was product. I got to know that product. I sure mm -hmm. need to know that product I can learn a product in a closet. That's right. really not the answer. My answer was they have to be able to take a punch. They mm -hmm. have to be able, I, I don't know, I don't know which question that you can actually get that out of, but the reality is most salespeople, you learn who they are after they got knocked down and right. how fast they dust themselves off and take a step forward and get back up again. Yeah, my, my world, it's resilience. I mean, yeah. same terminology. I mean, I don't win them, you don't win them all. Right. And you got to be able to bounce back and go on to the next call, to the next situation. Uh, and deal with the disappointment, deal with the rejection, and have it not change anything. So it's, right. a, it's the same concept. Right. And a case study will allow us to interpret that. Mm -hmm. uh, just simple, tell me about yourselves and what did you sell where and how did you sell who? I can't figure it out from that. I like the case study and I and I'm more impressed when they're when they're talking about struggling and how they're dealing with it because yeah, that's and, the real and, world. And I'll confess ignorance because I don't know your books. I know I've seen the topics of your books. I know you've got a customer centered orientation to selling, uh, which is the background I come out of. I want to see if they will ask questions. Are they going to go into features and benefits or are they right. going to ask questions to determine what I as the customer am concerned about? All of that, I think, comes out in a case study and a presentation. It's a sim it's a simulation. Yep. So, so folks, you learned a couple of things. You're learning a lot about ethics, and you're learning a lot about how to assess people on things that are very hard to measure mm -hmm. <laughs> in a in a question and answer session. All right, we're coming down the home stretch. You, Rick, you said something earlier. It made me smile. You said, you know, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Whatever. Note to self. We'd have been done already if I wasn't really interested in this topic <laughs> and you weren't knocking it out of the park. So I, I have two more questions for you. I'll, I'll let I'll, you go. I'll take that as the interest and we're in a, on a, in a good place. That's fine. Yeah, real good place. Okay. Uh, a couple of takeaways. All right. If you wanted people to walk away from this conversation, uh, I want them to remember everything. But if we only wanted them to, to remember two or three key points, what would they be? I think number one, it's higher ethical leaders. I mean, I, and, and I'll be, I, I'm absolutely a big believer that the the best investment you can make in an organization or on a sales team is to hire ethical leaders because I don't have to worry about the development piece at that point. I mean, I can worry about other skills, but it's a hiring piece. Um, I think second, it's looking at are your systems aligned to get the behaviors you want? We didn't talk about that a lot, but boy, in sales, that that's such a big issue. You used a couple of examples to say, you know, yeah, you want you want sales because we want the bottom line or we want the top line, depending on how you measure it. But we also want satisfaction measures in there as well and compensation tied to that. If you don't do those things and the and the reward system um, is skewed in one direction or other, you're going to get you, you know this as well as I. you're going to get the behavior you expect. And that's not going to always be good in every case. Um the, and the last thing I, I would say, and just emphasize, it's an ongoing battle, and you need to continue to talk about it in your your meetings, whether those are quarterly, monthly, weekly. You need to talk about, are we doing the right things? And as a leader, I've got to be open to hear criticism. I mean, yeah. people who disagree with me. I and mean, we didn't talk about that much, but I think it's crucial. Well, you got a deep topic there. I'm with you. Um, and I think... I don't know if companies are still doing this, but I do remember a few of my companies bringing outside groups in to take um, assessments, mm -hmm. you know, private and you know personal assessments, because we can't let the managers necessarily handle the assessments of their performance. Uh, that's, yeah, you that's know, real quickly, I'm, I'm not a psychologist by background. I've worked with a lot of yeah. them uh, over the years. And the, the psychologists will say, if you, if you, have an unstructured random interview process you know 
just it, which is chemistry basically um you're going to get random results out of that meaning yeah. it's not going to be real predictive of success in hiring whether it's good sales people or good leaders it's got to be structured in a more systematic way yeah yeah and and one point that i'm walking away with because i learn things every time i get somebody i have the privilege of having a conversation with people like you rick uh, I'm walking away remembering how important it is to hire those ethical leaders, because as you said it, I thought the ramifications of not doing that is infecting the entire team. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, 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 I don't want to put one in front of the other, but that that's one of those that I think we have to constantly be aware of. And I yeah, appreciate I mean, you bringing that you point. Know, and, and last comment I'll make. I mean, if anybody wants to prove everything you and I've been talking about, they should go back and read about Enron. Uh, I think the what's the, what's the book on Enron? Smartest guys in the room, uh, yeah. and they were smart, yeah. but the the values weren't there. They weren't necessarily moral in the first place, and the reward system was so skewed to making money that it became a fraudulent operation. So, yeah. if you yep. if you want a warning shot, read that book. There it is. The practice of ethical leadership: insights from psychology and business and building an ethical bottom line. I'm assuming we can get that anywhere online or at the store, correct? Well, you, online in particular, you can get it anywhere. The easiest place is to go to our website, which is ethicalbottomline.com. We can direct you to various sites and we can give you a little discount on the book. Outstanding. Uh, now, I'm, I'm going to stay there because that was, remember I said two questions. My last question was, how did people get a hold of you? So, A, you gave us the website. Um, uh, Anything else you want? You want them to reach out on LinkedIn? The, yeah, I was just going to say the easiest thing, reach out by my name on LinkedIn. I'm happy to connect with anybody. Uh, you can get my email from there. We can talk. So it's Rick Swigan uh, at, on LinkedIn uh, and we'll go from there. And yeah. the same offer holds true. If you're interested in the book, I can get you a discount through LinkedIn as well. Perfect. And that's Rick, just the way it sounds. No period, nothing. Swigan, S-W-E-G-A-N. For those Correct. of you, because you know how the internet is. It likes things spelled right. Okay. Uh, outstanding. Uh, and when you get the book, if you, here's my, I'm just author to author. Yeah. I like, I, I, I actually move books from my website. My only thing is I do like those Amazon sales just because I can get an Amazon review from it. That's verified. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, either way, whether you get it off of this website, where you get it off of Amazon, make sure you put a review in there. It really means a great deal to authors. And we got a brand new book here. This book's not a month old yet. So uh, we got to we got to move that algorithm a little bit. So grab that book, look for it. And by all means, when you get that book and you're done reading it, put a nice review on there. It really means a great deal to authors, including guys like me. OK, so, well, sir, I have enjoyed it. I, Likewise, a, a, a walk down ethics lane, if you will, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I really enjoyed it. It's a, it's a, it's a. When, when uh, it was this topic, when you were pitched to me, I jumped instantly because I can never have too much conversation about ethics because we're circling back to how we came out of the gate. Mm -hmm. We can be there, we can stay put, but I, I think you got to go one and zero every day, as the manager of the Washington Nationals says. Each day presents its own case study if you want and, and i think it, it's a great way to put it because constant vigilance is the name of the game bingo so, hi go. bob i appreciate it very much thank you i look forward to seeing this come out at some point and i pre appreciate the pitch about amazon as well you bet all right folks we'll do it again as well as we can next time until then stay safe thanks so much for listening if you enjoyed today's show, please rate and recommend it on iTunes, Outcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get more information on this show and Rob at Jollis.com.